you now have 237,000 employees. That's a lot. How can you possibly uh, give them direction and so forth? And how many times a day or year do you have to go out and meet all your employees? How do you do that? So that number, when we talk about being smaller, we're smaller in a few different ways. Uh, we peaked at 375,000 employees. We're down to 237,000. We've created alignment in the firm through scorecarding and creating uh, common senses around goals and things that we're trying to achieve. And if you go back and you look hi historically of one of the ways we got in trouble, one of the things you realize is when you sit in your chair or my right. chair running a, a company and you ask for things, people try and do it. One of the things we asked for is we said, as a company, we're going to grow. And today is an example. There's a lot of places in the world we'd like to grow. And there's absolutely places in the world where we do not want to grow. And making sure that you're very focused as an institution and those messages get on the ground in a very clear way. As part of that, I, I do spend a lot of time traveling, you know, approaching at certain times half of, half of my time. I think I made it to about 60 countries last year. I, I, I haven't kept track so far this year, but uh, like you, I was in Asia last week and was four countries while I was there. To me, there seems to be an element missing from the current conversation. And that's an honest discussion and appraisal of the real value that banks of all sizes contribute to our economy on a local, regional, national, and global level. Let me touch first on an issue that I think still is justifiably on many minds. And that's the question of whether our global financial system is safer now than it was before the financial crisis, and whether, in fact, the size and scale of some banks today may still pose a threat to achieving our common goal of making our financial system safer and sounder. Let me answer these questions by speaking to the company that I know best, and that's Citi. First, we're a much different institution than we were before the crisis. Second, our firm isn't big just for the sake of being big. We're deliberately scaled to serve our clients in the communities and cities around the world. And third, and importantly third, in an era of globalization, this country, indeed all countries, need banks like ours to help multinational companies grow, expand, and remain competitive in a rapidly changing economic environment. As a company, We've taken responsibility for our actions, and it was right and it was necessary for us to do so, which means today we can honestly describe ourselves in four words, simpler, smaller, safer, and stronger. That's because in many ways, as an institution, we've gone back to our roots, focusing on providing banking services to consumers and institutions. We've shed more than $700 billion of assets, 60 non-core businesses from many parts of the world. We no longer are in the insurance business, hedge funds, private equity. We aren't an asset manager, and we aren't a retail broker. We're a bank. As Diana said, over the next few days, um, we're going to be discussing uh, all kinds of things. I think very importantly, how we can all work together to create new partnerships and frame the way that we advance financial inclusion around the world. And I'm proud of the role that City's taking in terms of helping to facilitate these conversations. Today, what I'd like to do is to talk a bit about City's perspective on why we believe the time is right to begin to pull together our collective resources, our knowledge, and connectivity to achieve the goal of greater financial inclusion. I think it's important for all of us to recognize, and as Diana said, we at Cert City certainly recognize that that goal is achievable. And I know it's not only important for the communities where City operates, but there's also a value proposition that aligns City's core business strategy with this. I think as we look at the future, and we've got to recognize at least three secular global dominant trends of which we against City have tried to align our business. Globalization, urbanization, and digitization. Financial inclusion is a goal that's closely aligned with all three of these trends and with our efforts to seize them on behalf of our clients and our stakeholders. 
I think we all recognize globalization and what's happening in terms of the rapid advances in technology and communication and what that means in many ways. Our world is becoming less fragmented and much more interconnected. Today, when we talk about growth, we don't mean growth only in the, in the pockets of the developed world, but the economic expansion that is taking place across our geographies. The organization that recognizes this will be best positioned to seize these new opportunities and support new and growing markets. Today, we've also got to recognize that more than 50% of the world's population lives in cities. And by 2050, that number is going to be north of 70%. And with that, it'll create both challenges and opportunities related to how urban populations will interact with each other and their surroundings, the phenomenon of urbanization. As this population shift accelerates, a larger and larger share of global GDP is going to be generated in cities and the incomes of its city dwellers that live there. A central focus of our work has to be to ensure that these new urban residents are able to access services and products that give them a foothold in their local economies and allow them to save and build assets and to improve their quality of life. And when we talk about digital, digital touches every aspect of our lives and business. In business, from front office to back, from consumer to institutional, and it's transforming the way life is lived and business is conducted on every continent in every sector. For banks, online and mobile technology has the potential to improve security, increase efficiency, lower costs, and enhance connectivity and convenience for both large payers and individual end users. This last point, I believe, is especially relevant to those with low incomes. More than six billion people today worldwide have access to a mobile phone. Like never before, there's now the ability to directly deliver information, education, and payment services directly into the hands of most of the world's population. That capability represents an opportunity to rapidly accelerate provisions of safe and convenient financial solutions and information as to how these tools to those currently disconnected from the financial mainstream. But I think we also need to acknowledge the magnitude of the challenge upon which we're all focused this week. I'm nonetheless very proud of City's longtime leadership in this area, an area we remain committed to into the future. Thanks to the high impact investments of our City Foundation, we've worked with organizations and thought leaders to conduct on the ground testing and fuel innovative thinking about what a more financially inclusive world looks like. So if you were to go back to your alma mater, Harvard, or Harvard's business school, and, and try to say to young people, they should come into banking because it's such a great business to be in, what would be your best argument about why people should go in and want to be a banker? Well, probably twofold. One is you look at what's going on in the world, and I describe to our employees, we have a front row seat and are on the field to most things going on in the world. And there are very few industries, very few professions, very few companies where you have the ability to really stitch the world together. The world's only going to become more global. Second, very exciting time from a technology perspective. The push to digital and what's happening there and the, the transformation that we're just starting in terms of what banking is going to look and feel like, it's very exciting. So is recruiting hard or easy these days at good college campuses? I would say it is, um, it's not difficult, but in fairness to that, the banking industry is not hiring the way it used to. So we have the ability to attract good candidates. We have the ability to be selective in terms of uh, the people that we hire. We have the ability to compete at, at you know, all, the, all the schools, but the numbers are down. We're now clearly on a path towards growth and stronger returns. And today, we want to discuss where we are as a company, where we've come from, and what you can expect from us going forward. When I think of city, the word that comes to my mind is pride. 
I have to tell you how proud I am of the progress we've made and how we've executed through tough decisions in terms of our capital, our balance sheet, and our business model. We've been rebuilding our credibility, our relationships with our regulators, and very important, a culture that's based on ethics and execution. And our progress, it can be seen not just through the robustness of our businesses, but also through the investments that we've made in controls to improve processes across risk, compliance, and audit, which gives us our licenses to run and to grow our business. The combination of those gives us confidence in our ability to serve our clients while securing the significant CCAR results that are necessary for improved returns on capital going forward. And today, when we speak about the company that we are, it's just as important to recognize the company that we're not. We don't try and be all things to all people. We're not an asset manager. We're not a hedge fund. We're not an insurance company. We're a bank a bank with a clear and stated mission of enabling economic growth and progress as we've been doing since we opened our doors in Wall Street in 1812. We come to work every day with a singular focus on delivering for our clients and for our shareholders. But for all of our accomplishments, of which my 215,000 colleagues and I are extremely proud of, we recognize our job's not done. We haven't yet delivered the level of returns that you, our investors, both expect and deserve. You've been patient with us, and I want you to know that we don't take that patience for granted, and we know that it's not inexhaustible. But we have used that time and our resources wisely. Honing our focus has allowed us to concentrate on our resources and franchises and put markets that are critical to our future and to invest for a level of growth we couldn't have supported in the years immediately following the crisis. And now, these actions are showing tangible results. We've made important investments to streamline our infrastructure and to improve the client experience. We've invested in US cards, focusing on our products, our rewards programs, technology infrastructure, and our partnership agreements. We've returned to growth in both Asia and Mexico consumer. We've extended our leadership in franchises such as Treasury and Trade Solutions and fixed income. And we've positioned ourselves for further share gains in equities, among other areas. This momentum, it gives us confidence that we're now on a path towards steady improvements in returns from this point going forward. 